We're going to move on to the first law of thermodynamics. What the first law of thermodynamics says is that you have conservation of energy, but you can actually change the form of that energy. So we're going to talk about how gases, how we can calculate the work done by gases as we add, uh, as we, uh, add heat to them. So um, we start with defining a system. So a system, the system is going to be where we draw the, we're going to draw a boundary around a system. And that's going to be a self-contained air, contained area. It can have surroundings and that may be relevant, but, um, but we're only interested in the surroundings if the system is open. You can also talk about a closed system. In a closed system, you don't have um, energy ex or particle or mass exchange with the system in the outside world. Now, there's almost no perfect closed systems, but there's a lot of things that are approximately a closed system. And we're mostly going to be defining a system where we're approximating it as not interacting with the outside world and seeing how, or, or only interacting in a specific way, and seeing how that system exchanges energy with, uh, with its surroundings. And we're going to do this by work and PV diagram, by calculating the work and the PV diagrams. So when we introduced the concept of work, um, we said that the work is going to equal the integral of the force dotted with the, um, with the displacement. Now here, many of you are taking calculus concurrently, um, but I'm going to assume that you've already moved into the second, or you're moving near the, you're at the end of the first semester. So if I draw this integral, you have some idea what I mean. The non-integral form is that you would take the force dotted with the average displacement. Um, we're going to work through a little bit using calculus. If you have not taken calculus, you can move on without uh, without following every step. Um, but I do hope that before you get to the advanced classes, you will consider going back and reviewing it so that you've seen the calculus. Now, if we have a gas, a gas uh, has some pressure, and that pressure is exerting a force on the walls of the container. So here, you can see a, a, a schematic diagram showing a piston. And you have a gas with some pressure inside the piston. And the force exerted by that, so here we have three rigid walls and one movable wall. That's a good model of a piston. Um, and then the force exerted is the pressure times the area of the, of the piston. And then you can calculate the amount of work given so that a, a, the amount of work given, a, we'll do a small chunk of work given, is the force times the displacement but now the force is the pressure times the, um, times the area times a small, chunk of, um, a small chunk of the displacement. Or we can write this is a small change in the volume. So we have that the work done is equal to the pressure. A small amount of the work done is equal to the pressure times the volume. So then we can integrate this and get the total amount of work done. We're going to use our ideal gas law to integrate it in different cases. So here you have a gas expanding slowly from volume 1 to volume 2. Um, and what we assume, so here you have the pressure and the volume changing. So let's make an approximate, so there's, we can, we're going to deal with three different situations. We are going to use constant temp temperature. This is called an isotherm. We are going to use constant volume. This is referred to as isochoric. Um, and then we're going to use constant pressure. This is isobaric. So in each of these three cases, we can calculate how much work is done. Um, now, if we have uh, in any case or anything in between, if we want to calculate the work done, um, 
you have pressure and volume, the total work done is going to be the area under the curve. So then we're going to calculate expressions for the work done in each different case. So here you can see uh, if you have a cycle where, for instance, you are taking a gas around different, um, to different places in the phase diagram, and um, you will end up going back to the same place. So how much work is done in that cycle depends on which path you take. So here, if you do A to B to C to D and then back to A, you will do one amount of work. You can also do A to C to D to A, and then you do a different amount of work. Um, and here you can show different, so this is different thermodynamic states. You can travel different paths to get to the same point. So you will do, um, you would do different amounts of work in, in different cases. Um, when you're talking about, uh, we call the ideal gas law an equation of state. That means that the, the ideal gas law tells you everything that you need to know about the properties of that gas. Um, so as soon as you know the temperature and the volume, that tells you the pressure, that tells you everything you would need to know about an ideal gas to calculate its properties. Um, the ideal gas law doesn't tell you how you go from A to B. Um, depending on the route, you can do more or less work. And then, now the ideal gas law is going to take you from different states, so the, the change in the internal energy of the system is going to be the same however you go. Um, and ah, when we talk about these processes, we're going to be talking about them as quasi-static. And what that means is that uh, at any given point, you're basically in equilibrium at that point in the phase diagram. So if you have some expansion, you are giving the system, an, if you, you can imagine if you, for instance, allowed a volume of gas to expand, you could let it expand so fast that the gas doesn't actually have time to reach the pressure that, that it would at equilibrium. That's not the case we're considering. We're considering that, okay, you're going slowly enough that the, the system reaches equilibrium. Um, if you have a non-quasi-static uh, static process, you don't know the states that travel, you don't know what path you go to between A and B. Um, we can consider, for instance, expanding a system in a constant temperature. So here you have a heat bath, um, and that's making the assumption that you have some way of keeping the system at constant temperature, and then you're going to, you can change the amount of pressure, um, and that's always an approximation of the world because you never have a perfect heat bath. But for instance, if you're talking about driving your car outside, your car does not, when even if it releases heat into the, um, into the air, it does not do so fast enough to change the temperature of the air significantly. Uh, if you are in, if you're running a boat in the ocean and your boat motor releases some heat into the, uh, into the ocean, it does not measurably change the temperature of the ocean. So that's a heat bath. It's some body which is large enough that it can absorb all infinite heat, but it also can give infinite heat to the system in order to get the system in to have some constant temperature. So as an example, if you have this piston here and you, um, you remove weights on the piston, the piston will move up because it is, uh, it, because there is less pressure acting down on the system. So the piston will move up. Microscopically, the temperature will, for a very short time, the temperature will not be constant, but there's going to be collisions of the gas with the walls so that the temperature reaches the temperature of the heat bath. Um, so in that case, energy would flow into the system in order to keep the system at constant temperature. So here you can see an, 
a, an example of an isotherm or uh, the path given by an isothermal ex expansion from a state A to another state labeled B. Um, so if you have an isotherm and you want to calculate the temperature, we are going to integrate this. Um, now we want to use our ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Now we want to write everything. Uh, so the volume, uh, we're going to write the pressure in terms of the volume. And we're going to integrate the volume. So if we write our pressure in terms of the volume, pressure equals nRT over V. We plug this in here. So the work is equal to nRT over V. We're going to go from V initial to V final. And we're integrating with respect to dV. I can pull n, r, and t out of the integral because they are all constants. I am dealing with an isotherm. Isotherm means const constant temperature. So I can integrate from the initial volume to the final volume, dV over V. This integral gives me the natural log of the volume. Again, if you are not yet through, if you have not yet seen integrals, you can ignore this part, and the, which is the derivation, and move on to uh, just using the equation. All right, natural log of the final volume minus natural log of, uh, here I wanted the initial volume of the initial volume. This is equal to natural log of Vf over V initial. Okay, so if you're, uh, so that's the amount of work done. Um, and if you had to calculate that work, you would usually be given this point and say the final volume. And then you would have to use the ideal gas law to calculate what the final pressure is um, and what. Sorry, if you're given the initial volume and the final volume, you can calculate the work right off the bat. But if you are given the initial pressure and the final pressure, then you have to use the ideal gas law to calculate the two endpoints. All right, so that's what we do for an isotherm. Um, here, you have an insulated piston with some hot compressed gas. The piston moves up, the volume expands, and the pressure and the temperature decrease. The internal energy goes to work. If the expansion occurs within a time frame in which negligible heat can enter the system, then the process is called adiabatic. Ideally, during an adiabatic process, no heat enters or exits the system. That is our final um, constant is adiabatic, so we use S to refer to something called entropy. If entropy is constant, we call this adiabatic. And that means that there's no heat exchange between the system and its environment. OK, so two vessels are identical, except that the piston at the top of A is fixed, where the piston at the top of B is free to move against a constant external pressure. So in this case, this is constant volume. So that is isochoric. Um, and in this case, it is constant pressure. So it is isobaric. Um, and this is showing what would happen. So if you have um, some initial state, and then you poke a hole where there's gas on this side and a vacuum on the other, you poke the hole in here. Now the whole system has no heat. Ex so this is a closed system. Here you're going to end up expanding, and you do not expanding the volume of the gas, and you do not exchange heat with the surroundings. So this is going to be an adiabatic expansion. 
Uh, so adi an adi adiabatic uh, expansion is when it has to happen sufficiently slowly that you don't get this heat transfer. So one way that you could do that is instead of suddenly moving a, a mass off of your piston, you are slowly moving it one grain at a time so that the, um, the, the change happens very slowly. Um, there's slight differences between an adiabatic expansion and an isothermal expansion. Um, often when, for instance, in my class, I have students draw isotherms and, um, and the, the lines for an adiabatic transition, they look about the same, um, but the adiabatic transition has a slightly steeper slope on a PV diagram. Now we're going to move to some examples. All right. Now this is, there's a lot of examples in this class that you can calculate with, um, without doing integrals. Remember that the work is the area underneath the, the curve. So as shown below, calculate the work done in the um, quasi-static processes represented by the paths AB, ADB, ACB, and ADCB. Okay, so we will do the, um, we will set these up. So the first one, the work done in process A to B, I can just calculate the area. So here I'm going to calculate the area under the curve. And I do have to be a little bit careful because notice that my units here are atmospheres. One atmosphere is approximately one bar. One bar is 10 to the fifth pascals. So we are going to use the conversion here that uh, this is bars, which are 10 to the fifth pascals. And then here we have the volume in liters. Well, a liter is 1,000. I'm going to try to change my markers again. A liter is 1,000 milliliters, and a milliliter is a centimeter cubed. So I am going to, and there's 100 centimeters per meter. So I can cube this, and I get that a liter is 10 to the negative three meters cubed. So up here, I'm gonna write the liter as a as 10 to the negative three meters cubed. And when I calculate my work, I'm just going to do those conversions already. So in going from A to B, um, I have a height of one bar, so I have 10 to the fifth pascals times, now I have one, two times 10 to the negative three meters cubed. So I gotta have two times 10 to the negative 3 meters cubed. And I end up with 200 joules. I don't have to worry about the, so let me I just do once. A pascal is a unit of pressure, so it is force per unit area. Uh, so this is kilogram meters per second squared per meter squared, and I am multiplying it by meters cubed. So I end up with a unit of, I have to do kilograms, kilograms, kilogram meters squared per second squared. This is also known as a joule. If you did the conversions exactly, you would get slightly different numbers. Okay, now I'm going to look at part B. I am going from A to D to B. Now, 
The process of going from A to D does no work because there is no change in volume. The process of going from D to B does work. So now, I already know that this area is, let's see, this area right here is 200 joules. So I'm not going to recalculate this rank rectangle, but I have to calculate this triangle. So my work is 200 joules plus this height is 2 pascals, so sorry, 2 bar, bar, so 2 times 10 to the 5th pascals times a width of 2 times 10 to the negative third meters cubed, and then times 1 half because I have a triangle. So this again gives me 200 joules, and my sum is 400 joules. Part C. I go from A to C and then back down to B. So the process A to C also has a work done. I've got 200 joules and then this I also calculated. So this triangle is 200 joules. This triangle has the same area. So I again have 400 joules. For part D, I am going from A to D to C to B. Okay, A to D does no work. C to D does no work. So what I have to calculate is the work done going from D to C. So. Um, in C to D, I'm calculating this area, so that is 3 times 10 to the 5th pascals times 2 times 10 to the negative 3rd meters cubed. This gives me 6 times 10 to the 2, or 600 joules. So if I were meticulous about the conversions, I would have slightly different numbers. Um, and you can do all of this geometrically without having to calculate any integrals. All right, now calculate the work done on the gas along the closed, circuit, the closed path shown below. The curved section between R and S is semicircular. If the process is carried out in the opposite work, the opposite direction, what is the work done on the gas? Okay, so it is asking you only the, the work done in this semicircular direction. So here we have a radius. We are going to, the radius is 1 right here. So we're going to use the same conversions so that one atmosphere is 10 to the fifth pascal and one liter is 10 to the negative third meters cubed. Of course, this is an exact conversion. This is an approximation. Now, um, if I go along this curved path, the only work done is the network done is the area of the semicircle that has um, that area is pi r squared. And so that is, we will calculate, so that is going to be in unit, that's pi r squared in units of atmosphere liters which have units of hundreds of joules. So this is pi, uh, the, the radius is one. So this has pi that I have to convert from liter atmospheres to joules. So it's 
200 pi joules. So again, I'm just using the fact that the work is the area enclosed in the curve. All right, here, find the work done in the quasi-static processes shown below. The states are given um, in these points. All right, I'm not going to go through each of these. I'm going to show you how you would do them. So here, for going from 1 to 2, you are just going to calculate the area under the curve. So you take the change in volume and multiply it by the pressure. Here, no work is done because there is no change in volume. Here, you have the area under the curve. And so you're going to have to calculate the area of that triangle, and it doesn't quite go to zero, so you're going to have a little tiny rectangle underneath. Over here, you have the work done here. That's negative. And then the work done there, that's positive. So you're going to calculate the work, the, the area here between the two lines. And here, you're calculating this area. And it's positive because you're going, you're going clockwise. Here, you have two areas, although I'd break it up into three. So you have a rectangle and two triangles. And you calculate those areas. Watch the conversions from atmosphere liters to, uh, to joules, but that will only make a slight difference in the, in the answer. OK, so here, during the isobaric expansion from A to B represented above, 3,000 joules of heat are added to, to the gas. What is the change in this internal energy? I didn't bring this up in my lecture, but the internal energy of a gas is, for an ideal gas, um, is, well, actually, sorry, I did, I did briefly mention it. It's 3 halves nRT. That's the amount of in, internal energy in the gas, depending on the temperature. Um, and here you have the, um, so you add 300 joules of energy to the gas. You can calculate what, uh, and then you have the heat done and the work. So now the heat added is equal to the change in internal energy. Sorry, the heat added plus the work is equal to the change in internal energy. So um, now you are told that the heat is 3,000 joules, 3,100 joules. I can calculate what the work is. The work is the pressure times the change in volume. So it is 10 to the fourth pascals times 0 0.15 meters cubed. So I am left with 1,500 joules. And that tells me that the change in the internal energy has to be equal to, ah, so I, I have to have, sorry, I put the work on the wrong side. The change in the internal energy is equal to 3,100 minus 1,500 joules. OK. Then what is the change in the internal energy for the process re represented below? Um, how much heat is exchanged? And um, so here you can calculate. So if it's a closed path in one cycle, 
Um, in the total cycle, there is no change in internal energy because you go, um, you go back to the same spot. Um, it's a closed path. So how much heat is exchanged? Um, then you have to have, uh, if you have the, the work equal, the, the heat equals the work plus the change in internal energy, um, you have the, the heat equaling the work for the cycle. Okay, let's, what you see here, these are showing different paths. So let's look at this one. When a gas expands along a path AC as shown, it does 400 joules of work and absorbs either um, 200 or 400 joules of heat. Suppose that you go along that path and the, ga the gas um, absorbs either, either 200 or 400. Which of these is correct? Okay, we're going to read this one a little more carefully. When a gas expands along path AC below, it does 400 joules of work, and it absorbs either 200 or 400 joules of heat. Suppose that you're told that along path ABC, the gas absorbs either, um, the, absorb, the gas absorbs either 200 or 400 joules of heat. Which one of these values is correct? Um, so if it does AC, it, uh, it does 400 joules of work. If it does ABC, it has to do, it absorbs either 400 or 200 joules of heat. So then if it is doing, so it's doing less work along the path AC, um, and then it is doing along the path ABC. Um, so we, but we end up with the same change in internal energy because we end up at the same spot. In either case, we end up at C, and C has a fixed temperature. So if along AC, it does 400 joules of work, so for work, AC equals change in internal, we've got some change in internal energy. It's generally going to be um, increasing the internal energy. And then it is absorbing heat. So the heat is the, so A to C is 400 um, joules, and then we have A, B, C has to equal the change in the internal energy um, plus the amount of heat, and therefore, if the work done, the work done for A, B, C is greater, so the heat done for A, B, or C has to be, the, the heat absorbs, uh, absorbed has to be greater along, um, along that path. So here, this is an example of a logic problem and then if you have, so given the, give the correct answer from, given the correct answer from part A, how much work is done along the gas, by the gas along A, B, C. Um, so you then would know how much heat was absorbed, so you know how much work is done. And then the, along C, D, the change in internal energy of the gas decreases by, uh, 50 degrees, how much heat is exchanged along this path. In this case, so the, um, you have no, so the internal energy changes, but you do no work. 
So all of that exchange must be due to heat. All right, when a gas expands along AB, as shown below, it does 20 joules of work and absorbs 30 joules of heat. When the gas expands along AC, um, it does 40 joules of work and absorbs 70 joules of heat. How much heat does the gas exchange along BC? So here, you're going to use the fact that there is no work, but the change in internal energy is the same. So it helps to write out these equations for, uh, that tell you what the heat and the work is done in each case what heat and work is done in each case. All right, a dilute gas is stored in the left chamber of a container whose walls are perfectly insulating and the right chamber is evacuated. When the partition is removed, the gas expands and fills the entire container. Calculate the work done by the gas. In this case, you have no heat exchanged with the environment, um, but you do have work done because the gas expands. It looks like the gas expands roughly by a factor of two, so the internal energy is going to change. So you would have to have the exact numbers to solve this one, um, which I didn't copy down, but that tells you how to set it up. All right. Ideal gases are stored in an insulated container. The partition is removed and the gases mix. Is any work done in this process? No, there is no net change in the volume, so there is no work done. If the initial temperatures of A and B are initially equal, what happens to their common temperature after they're mixed? Their common temperature is still the same. That temperature is a measure of the average um, speed of the, the molecules and atoms of gas. All right, consider the process for steam in a cylinder shown below. Suppose the change in internal energy is, uh, in the process is 30 kilojoules. Find the heat entering the system. You would calculate the work done. Um, and because you can calculate the amount of work done and you know the change in internal energy, you can calculate the heat in entering the system. This is showing an ideal gas expanding isothermally along a path AB. It does 70 joules of work when it goes from A to B. How much heat does the gas exchange? Now this is showing isothermally, so you would have to use the exact form for an isothermal, um, for an isothermal transition. The gas then expands adiabatically from A to C um, and does 40 joules of work. So then you would have to calculate, I like to always calculate the exact points along the PV diagram, so I have the temperature, the pressure, and the volume. Um, and then it is returning along C and it exhausts uh, CA and it exhausts 100 joules. In how much work is done along that path, you would have to use the pieces from each of the individual paths. We're going to skip over that one, and with that, we're going to end this chapter. Thank you.